Hey everybody, welcome back to AIT 1003 where we are going to be delving into pneumatics. Uh, we've talked about hydraulics so far and all that they can do for us. Um, we're going to talk about pneumatics and what they can do for us and you'll see some similarities and some differences as well. Uh, we're going to dig, dig into that. Uh, this lesson uh, and all of the little mini lessons that we've got here for the lectures in this one are very important. It's critical that you take notes uh, during this particularly when we're talking about uh, Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, uh, Gila Sachs' Law, things like that. Um, I told you before, and I'll tell you again, I'm not trying to teach you math, and I'm not trying to show you formulas just for the sake of working formulas. Um, we will be getting into those uh, in this lesson, but I'm showing you these because they impact our entire system, and I'm going to show you why through the work of some of these uh, scientists from a couple hundred years ago, uh, and uh, how it's relative to our system. Okay, so we're going to be talking about pressures, temperatures, uh, volumes, and things like that. And so we need to understand how one impacts the other because it's going to impact our real world pneumatic system. Okay, so we're not going to talk a whole lot more about that other than be taking notes, bring your notes uh, to lab, you know, regardless of what lesson it is. Uh, you need to be studying those and uh, make sure you got them with you at all times. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and delve into them. Just make sure you do that first, okay? All right, so uh, first thing about pneumatics, uh, probably that anybody will tell you, is that pneumatics are not as strong as hydraulics. We talked in our hydraulics lecture about moving some pretty heavy loads. We, did, we were able to calculate our, uh, our work and our force and the area of our, of our pistons required to move this force. We're talking about some pr pretty heavy loads. Pneumatics, we don't have that as much, okay? Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, hydraulic fluid is not compressible, and air, of course, is. We're going to continue to delve into that. But uh, pneumatics is used extensively in the food production um, industry, uh, also high-speed manufacturing. Um, it's because, and one of the reasons that it's used in food uh, production is because we don't want to contaminate any of the food with by having hydraulics uh, near it, okay, because you're going to have leaks or you're going to have a line bursts and things like that. Um, I was a maintenance supervisor at a feed mill uh, some years ago, and uh, everything that we had in that building ran on compressed air. Uh, I think with the exception of the fork truck, it had hydraulics. But all the equipment that handled the food, the, uh, the, the uh, animal feed, um, was, uh, you know, the whole process used pneumatic cylinders and pneumatic uh, motors and things like that because if we were to break a hydraulic line and it get into the fluid into the uh, feed mix or something like that and we not know it we could ship several tons of uh, feed uh, to farmers and uh, livestock producers and kill their uh, livestock so same thing with uh, with uh, food for human consumption as well don't want to mix those two because it come out uh, kind of on the bad end ruins somebody's day but that's one of the reasons they're used in, in, um, in uh, food production. And like I said, and they're used in high-speed automation as well because they're very, very fast actuators, a lot faster than hydraulics. Um, this is a picture of a, of a conveyor very similar to one that I worked with before. I don't know if you can see it right now, but there are uh, airlines going up to these clutches. These are pneumatic clutches, and what happens is a solenoid will open up, shoot air to the back side of that uh, clutch, basically a piston, Okay, get back behind there, and we'll engage these clutches. And the neat thing about it is, is um, you can you can start and stop sections of the conveyor using these pneumatic clutches. Um, like for example, if there was a box right here in this photo, I detected a box, it would want to stop it so it wouldn't dump it in the floor. However, there may be room for moving boxes that are further up the line, all the way up to this point right here to, to make it stop. So this section of the conveyor can stop by disengaging the clutch, and this one will continue to keep these rollers moving until the box broke this photo eye and disengaged that clutch there. So just look, another example of where pneumatics is used. Okay, in the packing industry as well, you see these pneumatic cylinders packing things in a box. Um, and this is an application that's really cool. Um, I uh, did some robotic programming for an uh, automotive manufacturer down in Alabama uh, here uh, several years ago. And uh, they used a dispenser to uh, put uh, the sealant around some of their panels and things like that. Um, and they used the, they basically had an pneumatic system mounted to the robot, and the robot would would point the uh, the uh, dispenser and take it all there, and it was using pneumatics to press that sealant out and apply it to the framework of the car. In this particular application, what we got going on is he's chucking up a bolt here, spinning the bolt, 
and it's supplying some uh, thread sealing, okay, or Loctite as a lot of people know about. Uh, but they're using uh, compressed air behind the piston to, to, to uh, dispense the sealant. And that's just another application. Like I said, uh, it's used a lot in manufacturing. Okay. Now, the way that uh, pneumatics is similar to hydraulics is that it relies on flow. Remember, we're not about pressure. We're trying to make things flow. We're trying to get fluid to flow or air to flow because that's what does the work for us. That pressure gets behind the flow and pushes it down the line for us, but it is the flow that we're after. Okay, that's the same in hydraulics and pneumatics. It's shapeless. Uh, it takes on the shape of whatever container you put it in, much like the fluid, the hydraulic fluid. Uh, well, the air does the same thing. Okay, and this is an important right here we want to keep in mind at all times because as we go through this, it seeks to move from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Okay, it's going to go uh, where the least, the, the path of least resistance. Okay, so it's not going to go to a higher pressure. It's going to go always seek a lower pressure get movement and get flow, okay? Um, the difference between some of the, uh, from a hydraulic system and pneumatics is that you have a lower viscosity with air. Now, viscosity is resistance to flow, how viscous something is. For example, I think molasses, for example, particularly on a cold morning, all right? Molasses is very thick. It flows very very slowly. It's resistant to flow, so it's, it's uh, got a higher viscosity, so it's more viscous, all right? Compressed air is not uh, as viscous, and it doesn't have that molecular bond. We'll talk about that in a second here. But um, it can, the air can be uh, compressed and decompressed into a chamber. It can also be compressed into a chamber in an air tank. Okay, um, you can. You really don't get very good results when you try to compress uh, hydraulic fluid. You don't have a lot of reserve there. The one thing that you can, you will have, is. Um, is an accumulator will store a little bit of pressure, but not nearly as much as like in a pneumatic system. And again, we'll see more of that later. And pressure is much more affected uh, by the heat of the heating of gases than it is of the fluid. Okay. Now I talked a minute ago about our, our being our uh, viscosity and things like that. First of all, air and gas move in what you see this in your book too. They move in what's known as a chaotic manner. They're just uh, sort of like squirrels at a rave. Okay. So you got all these, um, you got these um, molecules, and they are all over the place, and they're not really bound to each other too much because they don't have a very strong molecular bond. Uh, fluids, such as hydraulic fluid, things like that, they have a stronger molecular bond. They sort of group together, travel in a herd, you might say. It makes them more viscous, okay, or more less uh, less resistance to flow, okay. But that's because of the molecular bond that is in the liquid, whereas the uh, compressed air does not have as great of a molecular uh, bond, and that is what makes it easier for them to compress, okay? Now, we've got to talk about a couple of guys here that are very, very important. Some of the, some of the work did, that they did was very, very important to us, and I promise you, we're not talking about them to give you a history lesson. I am going to show you where they apply the work that they came up with how we apply that in a system, okay, that we uh, work on and we have maybe have to make modifications to, this is very applicable, okay, so it's not a history lesson, okay. Three guys we've got to talk about here is uh, Mr. Boyle, Mr. Charles, and Mr. Gila Sack, okay. First of all, we're going to talk about Mr. Boyle, okay. Uh, Robert Boyle said that as long as the temperature is staying the same, with kind of constant temperature where it's not fluctuating on us, the gas's pressure and its volume are going to be inversely proportional. And what that means is that when one goes up, the other goes down. If the pressure were to go up, the volume would go down. If the volume were to go up, the pressure would go down. Okay? So they are inversely proportional. And we're going to give you some application of that in just a little bit. But I happen to notice this guy's hair back here, though. And I started like, who's that guy look like? And I scratched my head. It looks like Slash from Guns N' Roses, GNR, okay? So I, I thought they was pretty similar, don't you? But anyway, so I started thinking maybe what if we did a little bit of comparison, um, just to, I don't know, kill it some time. So both of them have had a lasting impact on their profession. The scientists that we're still talking about today, okay, and uh, Slash's guitar work uh, is going to be talked about for, for you know probably centuries to come or maybe at least decades to come. But both of them have had a lasting impact on their profession. Mr. Boyle has probably attended a few parties, and this is a difference, whereas Slash has probably attended many parties, I'm just going to guess, okay? Uh, Mr. Boyle, 
he was influenced by his peers and other scientists, and uh, Slash was influenced by his peers and many parties. So there you have it, just a little comparison between the two guys, but I think we probably better focus on Boyle at this point, so let's do that, okay? Um, so he said, he said that if we have a decrease in volume, that we were going to have an increase in pressure, provided that the temperature was the same, okay? So we got little temperature gauges right here in our graphic. They're about 300 degrees. We'll call it 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And it looks like in this chamber over here, we got about four cubic inches of volume. And over here, we have run this little jack screw down here and compressed it down to two uh, cubic inches, all right? Now our temperature stayed the same, but look what happened to our pressure. It went from about one PSI to two. So we cut our volume in half and our pressure doubled, inversely proportional. Sounds vaguely familiar if you work with watts or power in the electrical field because amps and voltage are inversely proportional. So anyway, that is what Mr. Boyle has, has contributed to our science. Now Jacques Charlet, uh, but we call him Charles because we're in the United States, uh, he said that as long as pressure is constant, the gas, the uh, gas's temperature will be directly uh, impacted, whether increased or decreased, by its volume. Okay, let me say that again. If the gas's temperature it rises, uh, so will the volume. Okay, if the volume, if the gas's temperature decreases, so will its volume. They have a direct relationship with one another and a direct impact with each other. They are not inversely proportional, they are directly proportional, okay? But that's provided that the pressure stays constant. And that is Mr. Charles, all right? And we're, again, we're going to put all this into application. Now, Mr. Guy Lissac, he said that provided volume stays the same, the gas's temperature will increase with pressure, okay? And if we increase the pressure, we we'll increase the temperature. If we lower the temperature, the pressure will lower as well. So these two, the last two, Charles and Guy Lissac, their uh, volumes and pressures and their, um, and their temperatures and pressures were uh, proportionally uh, impacting each other the same, okay? So those are the three guys that we want to talk about. Um, <clears throat> going back to our pneumatic systems, and, and we are going to get back to this, okay, the guys are, but uh, going back to our pneumatic system, okay, we create uh, pressure, or excuse me, flow, my bad, we create flow with a couple of different types of air compressors. Number one is the reciprocating type. This probably reminds you of a gasoline engine with a single cylinder and a piston there. All right, it's reciprocating, going back and forth. All right, and there's another type, and it's known as the screw type, okay? Now, both of these uh, take our uh, take uh, atmospheric air, and we, uh, we will uh, decrease its volume and increase its pressure. Uh, Mr. Boyle's Law. See, I told you we are going to apply this stuff. Okay, so Mr. Boyle's law is already in effect. So we're creating flow. All right, now the other thing about a pneumatic system is it is not a closed loop system. Remember, in hydraulics, we took out of the reservoir, went to the pump, all through all of our conductors, all of our devices, and came back into the reservoir and repeated this cycle, or this, you know, had a, basically a closed loop. All right, um, pneumatics is not really a closed loop system because all of the air is pulled from the atmosphere and then when it, it goes through the compressor, goes through our conductors, all our devices, and comes back, but we exhaust it back into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is really not a closed loop. We don't call that a closed loop. So uh, our closed loop system is with hydraulics, and our pneumatic system is more of an open loop because, like I said, it does uh, dump back into the air. And in the fact that it dumps back into the atmosphere, that's fine. It makes it environmentally friendly because uh, if you burst a... Uh, a hydraulic line, it's going to puke everywhere on the ground, and now you've got an environmental hazard you've got to clean up with the air. It just goes out in the air where it came from, okay? So it is much more uh, environmentally friendly, all right? And of course, uh, with our air compressor, our, our pneumatic system, uh, we have these air compressors with these receiver tanks that we'll talk about, uh, and their job is to maintain pressure in the system by uh, monitoring, check, you know, with, uh, with pressure uh, sensors and then resupplying that air pressure uh, after it's completed to a certain point, okay? And this is, a sim this is simply a uh, schematic with uh, some actuation going on here, we're pulling out of the uh, atmosphere, and we're dumping back into the atmosphere after it goes back through our uh, directional control valve. 
But that is what we've got so far. That's just a little intro on uh, compressors uh, and our pneumatic systems and Boyle, Charles, and Guy Lussac. Uh, so that's, we're going to shut this one down for right now. And uh, we're going to continue in with the second half of this general lecture here. And then we're going to start getting into single uh, lectures based on Boyle, Elisac and Charles as well, okay? Because all their uh, work and all their formulas are going to impact the systems that you see right here that you're going to be working with, okay? And you'll see all that as we pull it together. But for right now, shut this one down, uh, take a little quick break, and come back with your notepad and pencil ready to take more notes, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.